My name is Brian Pico, and I'm a medical oncologist at Memorial Cancer Institute, where I focus on the treatment of general urinary cancers, which include prostate, bladder, kidney, testicular, and penile cancers. It is a pleasure to be talking about prostate cancer today. It is a topic that I feel does not get the attention that it deserves when you consider how common it is. And so hopefully from this discussion, I'll be able to answer some of your questions and uh, we can discuss prostate cancer um, at the end as well, if you have any uh, questions at the, uh, with, for the Q&A. Uh, so with that in mind, I'll get started. So I'll just kind of briefly go over uh, what is cancer. And basically, cancer occurs when a normal cell of the body develops, um, uh, develops an abnormal characteristic, which is characterized by unregulated growth, um, invasion into adjacent organs and tissues or, uh, and eventually distance spread to other sites. And uh, this can be any cell of the body. So for instance, um, it, you would, lung cancer is a cell originally from the lung um, that has unregulated growth, invades, and eventually distantly spreads. Um, one thing to clarify is that a cancer is uh, classified based on its primary cell of origin. So if you have a tumor in the lung, uh, and the pathology, when basically they get the biopsy and they look under a microscope and see what it is, if it's a cell originating from the prostate, it's not considered lung cancer, it's considered prostate cancer that metastasized to the lung. So the prostate is a small gland in men located just beneath the bladder that and, and it surrounds the urethra and creates uh, an ejaculate fluid. This fluid gives the sperm the right environment and nutrition it needs to fertilize the egg. Uh, we see that on average, the prostate gland doubles in size uh, from when a man is in his 20s compared to when a man is in his 70s. Um, and so over the course of time, this natural enlargement can impinge the urethra, disrupting the flow of urine, which can lead to urinary symptoms but keep in mind that just because you have urinary symptoms doesn't mean that you have prostate cancer. So uh, this is a picture just detailing the location of the prostate uh, so that you can have an idea of the anatomy. So how common is prostate cancer? Well, it might surprise you to know that it's the most common cancer in men. Uh, this data is from 2019. As you can see, there are over 150,000 new cases each year. And this makes up about 20% of all new cancer diagnoses in men each year. It's the second leading cause of cancer death in men following lung cancer. And it has uh, been estimated by the SEER database that there's an estimated lifetime risk of about 14% in all men. So most of us probably know someone with prostate cancer uh, which is why it's an important uh, discussion to have, and it's a, a big topic to educate ourselves and our community on. So here's a list of the risk factors. As men age, they are at higher risk of developing prostate cancer. Um, and basically there was a study done that showed that over 50% of men uh, at the age of 70 at the time of autopsy actually had prostate cancer and some were known, some were unknown, but over 50% of men at that age had it. And um, so that's obviously one of the risk factors. Ethnicity is another one. African-American men have a higher rate of the disease and they also have a higher rate of having a more aggressive disease. Um, and so that's something to keep in mind. Um, family history as well as a risk factor. If you have a brother or a father who has a history of prostate cancer, then there would be a two to three time fold increase in your risk. Um, smoking has been known to increase the risk and obesity has also been known to increase the risk of death from prostate cancer. So symptoms of prostate cancer include what we mentioned earlier, urinary symptoms. And these can manifest themselves as uh, difficulty passing urine, uh, frequent urination, 
uh, incomplete voiding. Uh, so you, you go to the restroom, uh, urinate, and you feel like you just didn't get everything out, and you're back uh, again within 30 minutes to an hour um, to have to use the restroom again. You can also see a more obvious sign of uh, blood in the urine or the ejaculate. And some patients also have pelvic pain. Um, there is a percentage of patients that don't have any symptoms, and that's what makes it uh, difficult sometimes to catch prostate cancer early. Uh, and so the big question is, what can we do to prevent this from happening, from, from not catching it, from trying, from trying to catch it early? What can we do to do that? Um, and so basically, that's what screening is. And different other types of cancers have well-known screening, like for colon cancer, uh, colonoscopies are done, uh, breast cancer, mammography is done. In prostate cancer, um, we have studies, we have tests that we can do, a blood test, and I'll go into that in a second, um, but there's been some controversy about that as far as who should get screened for prostate cancer, when it should start, and um, what happens if the test comes back positive? What do we do? So I'll kind of start by just talking about what the average risk person should do. And the guidelines, what they mention is that at the very least, a discussion needs to be had starting at the age of 50 to 55 with your doctor to determine if screening is the right thing for you. Um, and like I mentioned, it's, it's because with tests, depending on the result, it's going to come with further tests if it's positive. Um, for sure, high-risk men should highly uh, consider it. Uh, this discussion should also be had in high-risk men, including African-American men and men with a family history of prostate cancer. Uh, this discussion should be done earlier, most likely, at the age of 40, 45. Um, if symptoms are present, that's not really screening, right? So screening, we're trying to find people without any symptoms and catch a cancer that's there early. If symptoms are present, like the ones we mentioned earlier, then screening should be done to, to check if there's any uh, risk for prostate cancer. So how do we screen? So one thing we can do, uh, this is, you know, the, the traditional... A uh, classic thing that usually urologists do is a digital rectal exam. And, you know, it's, it's very subjective in the sense that based on the practitioner's experience, uh, you'll, you know, you might get different results from practitioner to practitioner. And that's not really good when we're trying to determine if someone's at risk for a cancer. So although this is done still, um, you know, it really is practitioner dependent. And a more objective study is the PSA blood test. So the PSA blood test uh, basically is checking prostate specific antigen. And this is basically a protein that's released from the prostate into the bloodstream. And we have a very sensitive test that, that, that picks up this this antigen in the blood and gives us a number to measure how much of it we detect. And based on your age, we have a range of what this number should be more or less. And when it's outside of this normal range, then that's when we can become suspicious for a possible underlying cancer. So this is a table here that basically shows age specific reference ranges for PSA and subclassified into different um, background and ethnicities. And uh, I'll be able to say that, like I mentioned, um, the prostate gland is smaller in younger men and it grows over time. And so the PSA levels, the normal PSA levels increase over time as well. And typically, a cutoff of about three to four is used. However, like I said, this varies from person to person. A PSA greater than 10 is definitely more concerning for prostate cancer. 
And a rapidly rising PSA level can also be associated with prostate cancer. And that's something to, to consider. If you had a borderline elevated prostate uh, PSA, uh, but you didn't want to pursue the next step, which would be a biopsy, and I'll talk about that in a second, uh, and you repeated the PSA and you found that it doubled in time over, let's say, a short period of two to three months, then that would be concerning. So this is just kind of a, a little cartoon here of uh, the summary of PSA blood tests. And like I mentioned, it's collected in the blood. Um, it's normal for all men to have some level of PSA, uh, but high levels are a sign of prostate cancer. Also remember that PSA can be elevated for other reasons, uh, whether it's a, a infection, um, or vigorous exercise, like in bikers or certain medications, um, that can be something that throws off the interpretation of an elevated PSA. And so that's why checking a PSA as a screening method has been controversial because sometimes we check it, it's elevated, but there is no cancer, but the patient underwent a procedure um, and you know, we also don't want that, right? We don't want procedures to be done on patients that didn't need them. But at the same time, if we don't check and catch prostate cancer early, then if we, once we catch it late, there's a higher chance of mortality. So it's this delicate balance of exactly how to use this test that it's important to have that conversation with your doctor when you're at that certain age that I mentioned earlier. Once we determine that we want to pursue a prostate biopsy, it's uh, a very quick procedure that can be done in the office. It can take uh, five to 10 minutes. Um, and it's a very low risk procedure. And basically uh, about one in four cases, cancer is found. Um, so uh, to get a good sample of the prostate, the biopsy is done uh, typically with 12 different small biopsies, 12 cores, six on each side, to try to get a true sample and representation of the prostate itself. Once we determine that a cancer is in the prostate from the biopsy result, then the next step would be to stage it. Um, because depending on the stage, it's going to determine the prognosis, which is how well you will do with your cancer. And it's also going to tell us what kind of treatment you would benefit from. Um, so the staging is based on a scale from one to four, with four being the most advanced. And the, the big three things that we look at when we stage prostate cancer is the size of the tumor or the extent of the, of the disease itself, you know, is it localized within the prostate? Has it spread to local lymph nodes? Or has it spread to distant organs throughout the body? Another thing we use is the PSA. So a PSA value of 20 or greater is consistent with at least a stage three cancer. And the last thing we look at is the Gleason score which is determined by the pathologist based on how aggressive the prostate cancer looks under the microscope. And you can see in this cartoon here uh, that uh, a, a Gleason, uh, Gleason score grade one, these cells look very organized. Whereas when you get down to five on the bottom, uh, the architecture is very distorted. Um, these, these cells look like um, they have uh, become an aggressive cancer and basically telling us that this cancer is, is very aggressive. So this can help guide treatment uh, when we combine these three modalities to get our stage. Imaging is also used uh, basically if a patient has any symptoms at the time of presentation or diagnosis, we would get imaging to see if there's any other sites outside of the prostate uh, any of the sites that are concerning for cancer, um, because that would obviously change the stage. We also have a, 
a relatively new modality, which is a PSMA PET CT scan, which is a scan that's specific to prostate cells. And it's very sensitive in detecting uh, possible prostate cancer that other conventional imaging studies are not able to, to, to use, to do. So that is also in our options of imaging. So once we stage, then how do we treat? And really the treatment of prostate cancer is an individualized approach that is different from person to person. And it really depends on different factors. Um, the stage is a, is a big factor, whether it's early stage versus late stage. And like I said, this is determined by these three components here. A patient's age and overall health is also something that we take into consideration. And the quality of life that they have and want to continue to have is also something that we consider because different treatments have different um, side effects. And so we do consider that in our decision making. Some of the main treatment options are listed here. Active surveillance is, you know, it, it's not that we're not doing anything because, it, you know, you say surveillance and yeah, we're not doing any surgery or treatment, but because I mentioned earlier how prostate cancer can be a slow growing tumor, um, sometimes when we see a less aggressive tumor, like I mentioned, a lower Gleason score, um, we can pursue active surveillance which is basically checking on, in on the patient with a physical exam, checking their PSA level to make sure that it's, it's not rising. And if anything is concerning, we can also get imaging to see if there's any active disease that's growing. Um, because when there is, then we can intervene and, and begin treatment at that point. Um, sometimes prostate cancer uh, takes a long time to progress into something more aggressive that that becomes life-threatening. Uh, many times we can live with a very slow growing tumor, especially if we have other health issues that are more urgent or more prominent. So that's one modality. Another one is, and, and the most common probably that we use for localized disease is surgery. Uh, we do a prostatectomy and uh, now they have very minimally invasive procedures uh, robot-assisted radical prostatectomies that can be done that decrease the amount of recovery time and have increased um, the, uh, the ability to, to do this procedure without as many adverse effects on the patient. Um, radiation is also an option of treatment. And you can see here uh, external beam radiotherapy where they map out exactly where they wanna give the treatment and then there's, for more advanced disease, systemic treatments, including hormone therapy and chemotherapy. Oh, I, I forgot to mention brachytherapy, which you can see here is basically radioactive seeds that can be placed inside the prostate. So can we prevent prostate cancer? Well, you know, there's been many studies that go over what we can do to prevent it. Um, I think one of the biggest ones is smoking, and this applies to many different cancers. If, you know, if you can avoid smoking or quit, that's always a good thing. Um, diet and exercise never hurt anybody. Uh, high Foods high in animal fat and low in, and a diet low in vegetables has been shown to potentially put you at risk for developing prostate cancer. Um, so I think diet and exercise is also something that can be incorporated if not being done and then screening. So it's very important to have that discussion with your doctor. I think that that's the biggest thing that's, that gets missed into the equation um, where some, sometimes, you know, your doctors are, your primary care doctor is taking care of your active issues and maybe not, they're overlooking something that can be done to prevent something in the future. And, and so if you are 50, 55, or if you have risk factors to develop prostate cancer, so 40 or 45, 
you should definitely be having that conversation with your primary care doctor regarding getting screened with a PSA test. So in summary, um, prostate cancer is the most common cancer in men. And identifying groups at high risk is essential because this can allow us to intervene with screening earlier. Uh, screening for early stage prostate cancer likely improves the rate of cure. And so it's important to have that discussion. Uh, prostate biopsy is needed to make the diagnosis. Various treatments are available. And like I mentioned, including minimally invasive techniques that have improved morbidity. And always remember that prostate cancer uh, is, is a very um, individualized uh, treatment plan for prostate cancer. Uh, everyone's cancer is gonna be different, uh, whether it's the stage, their personal lifestyle, their quality of life, their personal health, all these things are taken into consideration when developing the best treatment plan. Uh, so with that, um, I will end my discussion there and I'll stick around for any questions at the end. Thank you, Dr. Pico. Um, Tammy, I'm going to go ahead and make you co-host so that way you can be able to share your screen as well. Sounds good. Okay, are you able to see my presentation? Yes. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, I, so as I was introduced, I'm Tammy Adar, I'm a genetic counselor at Memorial Cancer Institute, and I'm gonna be talking today about hereditary prostate cancer. Um, so first of all, I just wanna give you a background about genetic cancer, such as myself, and then I'll go about, talk about hereditary cancer, as well as then get more specifically about common hereditary prostate cancer syndromes and genes, and then discuss genetic testing. And if we have time, get into a little bit about direct -to consumer testing, as well as Medicare fraud. So first of all, genetic counselors such as myself, we are not doctors, we're not nurses, um, but we are medical professionals that are trained in the area of medical genetics and counseling. So our job is to translate the complex genetic information into something our patients are able to understand. So we act as educators. And our goal is to help our patients and their families understand medical information and its connection to genetics and be able to have informed decisions about what's available to them and to feel supported in the decisions they make as they do adjust to that new information. So in a genetic counseling session, we do draw a detailed cancer family history that we call a pedigree. And that's that little picture on the right that's showing all those circles and squares. That is a picture uh, depiction of a family history. Um, and then we give a discussion about genetics and hereditary cancer. And we assess the patient's personal and family history of cancer to see if they would qualify for genetic testing and discuss the genetic testing options as well as the next steps for them. And to give a little hereditary cancer 101, first of all, when it comes to prostate cancer and most cancers, most of the time they are not hereditary. We know that 70% of all cancer, including prostate cancer is sporadic, that it's happening due to environmental reasons, lifestyle reasons, as well as random factors. And please excuse me, I say I put a little bit there about women that was from a different presentation, but similarly men um, risk for prostate cancer. Um, and then 20, 25% of the time, cancer is familial, um, where it's occurring due to environmental, lifestyle, age, random factors, as well as multiple small genetic factors. And these individuals do have a slight increased risk versus that of the general population. And 5 to 10% of the time, cancer is hereditary, where genetics are playing a very strong role, significantly increasing the risks, um, much more so um, than any other factor. And hereditary cancer, um, and cancer is all caused by genetics. And to give that really, really good background about it, I wanna talk about what our genes are. So our bodies are all made up of our cells. In our cells are our chromosomes. Our chromosomes are the big packages of our DNA. Our DNA is broken up into segments called genes, and those genes give the instructions on how to make proteins. So that's how our bodies all grow and develop. 
So hereditary cancer is inherited what we call an autosomal dominant inheritance. So first of all, all of these genes are normal genes. We have all of these genes, but what happens when you have hereditary cancer is that you're born as one of those copies of that gene not working. We get two copies of all these genes, one's from our mom and one is from our dad. So this isn't affected by gender. It can come from either parent. It does not matter the type of cancer. And this can be passed to men, it can be passed to women, and anyone who has a parent who has a hereditary cancer mutation does have a 50-50 chance of inheriting it. And why this causes increased risk is due to something called the two-hit hypothesis. Um, so when somebody has sporadic cancer, they're born with both of those copies working, um, but over time, one copy will get damaged, and then over time, the other copy gets damaged, and with no working copies, um, then there's nothing to stop cancer from happening since this is our cancer protector genes. Um, whereas when someone has hereditary cancer, they are born with one copy not working. So then they just need something to happen to that other copy and cancer will develop. And while this is a super oversimplified view of how cancer does occur, it gives you that basic idea that when someone has a hereditary mutation, um, cancer becomes easier and thus risks are increased. So when it comes to hereditary prostate cancer syndromes and genes, this is kind of a quick list of all the different genes. I'm going to talk about a few of them specifically, but you can see that there are many different genes that can be associated with hereditary prostate cancer. Most notably is BRCA1 and 2, often called BRCA together, and also given the name of hereditary breast and ovarian cancer. And while that is its name, really it does actually play quite a role with prostate cancer risk as well. Um, and you're going to hear me say this a lot of times because most of our genes involved with women's breast cancer do also increase the risk for prostate cancer. In hereditary cancer syndromes, female breast cancer and prostate cancer rather go hand in hand. Um, so BRCA1 um, is associated with a 7 to 26 percent risk for prostate cancer and BRCA2 um, is associated with a 19 to 61 percent risk for prostate cancer. Um, unfortunately, those um, prostate cancers associated with BRCA2 do tend to be more aggressive. They do tend to be an earlier onset and there is a higher mortality when it comes to BRCA2 related prostate cancer. Um, we know that in the general population, about one out of every 800 individuals will have a BRCA mutation, um, and this is more common in Ashkenazi Jewish individuals, where it gets to be one out of every 40 individuals. As well, since you know, this is hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, there is also a much increased risk for female breast cancer between 45 to 87 percent, as well as a much increased risk for ovarian cancer. There's also increased risk for male breast cancer, as well as pancreatic cancer. Um, and another gene associated with hereditary prostate cancer is one that is called ATM. Um, we know that um, individuals with an ATM mutation will have about a 6.3% risk for metastatic prostate cancer. So similar to BRCA1 and 2, um, unfortunately, her most hereditary genes involved with uh, prostate cancer is associated with more severe uh, phenotypes. Um, this gene is also associated with female breast cancer as well as pancreatic cancer and ovarian cancer. Another notable one is CHECK2. Unfortunately, we don't really have a precise number of what the risk is with prostate cancer, um, but we do know it is increased risk as well as increased risk for female breast cancer and colon cancer. HOXB13 is a rather newer gene and a little bit more interesting one because it's not associated with female breast cancer, but really solely prostate cancer. Um, and different studies have found that when they just did genetic testing on individuals with prostate cancer, uh, 1.4 to 6% of them did have a mutation in this gene. Um, and they do really see that it's associated with an earlier age of onset for prostate cancer and that it does seem to be increased incidence in the Scandinavian population. Um, another syndrome that we don't think about so much with breast, but is also associated with prostate cancer is one that's called Lynch syndrome. Um, it is one of the most common hereditary cancer syndromes out there. It's associated with five different genes, MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, PMS2, and FCAM. Um, and it's noted to be somewhere between a two to 5.8 fold risk of having prostate cancer, most notably with the gene MSH2, which gives a risk for prostate cancer about 23.8%. Um, but we don't really see it associated with aggressive prostate cancer so much. Um, now, the most notable cancer that's usually associated with Lynch syndrome is colon cancer, which between the different genes, the risk is somewhere between 8.7 to 61%, as well as lesser risk for many different other types of cancer, 
Um, I'm just gonna list it there because it's gonna take me a while to say, but a lot of our gastrointestinal, general urinary cancers can also be associated with Lynch syndrome. Um, and this is a depiction about some of our hereditary cancer genes. It kind of breaks you down um, which ones are the more common ones. This one that says MMR, that really is the Lynch syndrome genes there. So you can kind of see how common each of those are, but you see that this is the iceberg where we still have a whole chunk that's not known. Um, as much as we are learning, there's still much more to learn and more things to be discovered about hereditary prostate cancer. So when it comes to genetic testing, um, we tend to follow the NCCN, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, um, who's basically the governing body for cancer, and they have their guidelines about who should have genetic testing. Um, when it comes to prostate cancer, anyone who has metastatic prostate cancer or individuals who have prostate cancer with a Gleason score of eight or higher, so that gets into the high risk or very high risk individuals, um, all of those individuals should consider genetic testing even without a family history. Um, there have been studies that actually showed that people who had prostate cancer had a mutation, um, a good chunk of them was about 40% didn't actually have a family history. Um, and individuals who do have prostate cancer as well, who have a family history of tumor relatives that have breast or prostate cancer, or will also have a family history of ovarian, pancreatic, male breast cancer, or someone with metastatic prostate cancer, should also consider testing, even if they have a lower Gleason score, as well as individuals with prostate cancer who are Ashkenazi Jewish, again, regardless of Gleason score or family history. So with genetic testing, nowadays we do what we call panel testing, where we look at multiple genes at one time period. And when we were talking about 10 years ago, this technology wasn't really here. Um, but nowadays, this is really our standard of care. We're usually looking at somewhere between 50 to 80 genes. Um, and you know that one size doesn't necessarily fit all because we may be sending different uh, sizes depending on the family history, what the patient wants to be tested for, as well as what labs work with their insurance. Um, we usually do this via one to two tubes of blood, but sometimes we are also able to do it via saliva or sometimes even a cheek swab. And it usually takes about two to three weeks for this to come back from the laboratories. Um, and this testing is usually covered by insurance if patients meet those NCCN guidelines. So the insurances do tend to follow those guidelines. So generally a patient who will meet the guideline will generally get the testing covered by insurance. And when it comes to genetic testing results, we have three main types. So our positive is that we have a genetic mutation that we know increases the risk for cancer. Um, and as I just talked about before, that may increase the risk for multiple different types of cancer. So someone with prostate cancer may also find out that there may be increased risk for colon cancer or male breast cancer. And many genes will have specific guidelines about how to handle those risks. And then at that point in time, family members should also be offered testing. Um, because when it comes to genetic testing, it's a family affair. Um, someone who has a genetic mutation, their children, their full siblings will have a 50% chance to have the same mutation. Aunts and uncles, nieces and nephews, a 25% chance. Um, so we want to make sure that anyone else in the family is aware of the genetic mutation so that they can find out what they have a risk for if they do have an increased risk. Um, and then, you know, most of our genetic testing does actually come back negative since most, um, most cancer is not hereditary, and that means we don't see any mutations that would increase risk. It doesn't completely rule out hereditary cancer because of that depiction of the iceberg. Um, there's always things out there we don't know. So individuals who have negative genetic testing results and that those family members are telling their doctors. Um, and, you know, this still always, you know, because there may be something we don't know, can have increased risks for other family members. So that's why we want them to tell their doctors, as well as everyone has a background risk for cancer. Since most cancer is not hereditary, negative genetic testing results doesn't rule out the chance of getting cancer in your lifetime. Um, and we have a third category, which is called a variant of uncertain significance. And that's when we see a change in a gene that we don't really know what it means. We don't know if it hurts the gene enough to cause increased risks for cancer. But based on the information we have, we really treat these like negative results and we don't change any medical management or test family members. And that's because we know that these are fairly common. They'll happen in 30% of all tests. But when laboratories are able to get, gather enough information to figure them out, 90% of them do wind up being benign changes in the gene. So we treat them like nothing because they are common and almost always nothing. Um, 
Um, and then just to get a little bit what we generally do when someone has a genetic mutation that causes an increased risk for prostate cancer is that we do start their prostate cancer screenings early, usually starting around 40. Um, and lastly, I did want to just get into a little bit about direct-to-consumer testing and Medicare fraud. Um, direct-to-consumer testing is something that is available for genetic testing, where you can buy the kits on Amazon and other sites, um, spit into the little tube, and you'll get lots of information. Um, and some of them will also include information about hereditary cancer. Um, and I always want to give a big, big flag of caution for this because, well, this can be information. It's not a lot of information. Um, most of the labs only actually look for a few common mutations, generally somewhere between 3 to 27. Um, and BRCA1 and 2, for example, which is often in those uh, tests, are huge genes. There's literally over a thousand different mutations that can increase the risk for cancer for just those two genes. And as I already showed do a slide of 15 different genes that can be associated with hereditary prostate cancer. There's a lot out there besides that. Um, so it's really, really limited information. Um, those laboratories will also give a raw genome information that you can use a third party software um, to get more information, but that raw genome is not really a full genome. It's a little bit of a shortcut method. Um, and because of that, inaccuracies can really occur. Um, different studies have found that when someone had a hereditary mutation for cancer through third party software using that raw genome information, it was only correct 40% of the time. So 60% of the time, it was incorrect. It was a false positive result. And that doesn't even tell us what the false negative results may be. And also this information is not protected under privacy laws. And lastly, I just want to talk about a little bit about Medicare fraud, because unfortunately, this is an issue that has really been popping up a lot lately. Um, individuals may be getting screenings, either they'll get put in the mail, um, they sometimes they'll have little health fairs that will come out or come to people's doors, um, or you can get those robocalls that I have actually even gotten myself that's saying that my Medicare um, will be denied to me if I do not do a hereditary cancer testing, which is funny because I am not even of age for Medicare, not even close. Um, so obviously that is a scam. So you really do wanna be careful uh, genetic testing should really only be done in your physician's office. Your Medicare is not dependent on your genetic testing. Um, so you really want to be careful. Anything that's suspicious, you know, contact the HSS hotline. And so in summary, hereditary cancer affects the minority of people, but when it does, it really does significantly increase the risk for cancer. And mutations in hereditary cancer genes can affect individuals' medical management. And genetic testing has definitely expanded over time, but we still don't know everything and there's much more to be learned. And be wary of any genetic testing that is done outside a doctor or medical professional's office. Thank you very much.